I'd like to open this video with a heartfelt thanks going out to friends and family for assistance on this project. Without them, it would have not been possible. Thanks again. Few vehicles share the timeless beauty of the Myers Max. Watching it on a turntable will not produce a single bad angle. Its smooth curves are almost organic. As an artist, Bruce Myers created one of the most iconic and copied automobiles of all time. This example is a Myers Manx II. It was originally built in late 1969 or early 70. It sits on its original 1963 pan. It is titled and insured in Ohio as a mileage exempt 1963 Volkswagen Manx. It differs from the Manx 1 in that under the rear seat area it is flat. The Manx 1 had provisions for a spare tire and battery box. The Manx 2 had this area removed to accommodate the change Volkswagen made in 1968 to the IRS rear suspension. Myers also changed the dash to integrally mount the dash to be one with the hood. The later changes also streamlined the production process, allowing Manx to remain competitive with the ever-increasing number of cheap copies being made. Rough production numbers of the Manx 1 are around 5200 and on the Manx 2 about 300. The two are outwardly the same except for things that we've mentioned prior and a few other minor differences. As the builder of this machine, a dominating goal was to produce a traditional looking car that retained all the inherent qualities of its original design. We started out with extensive research of early buggy photos along with Myers Manx catalogs and advertising. Then by utilizing as many period correct parts as possible, the car still retains its survivor aura. That said, many subtle changes and upgrades bring it to the level that you see today. Very close attention to detail is a museum quality throughout. Wherever possible, original type parts were used. Examples include the Monza fuel cap, period correct wheels and tires, along with the Myers Manx supplied stainless steel roll bar and sidewinder exhaust. The front bumper is also correctly styled of stainless and mounted as original and not the typical clamp on that you commonly see in many new builds. This car also has numerous, albeit subtle, changes that are not individually perceivable. They do, however, collectively refine the natural beauty of the design. This is why when looking at two very similar buggies with the same wheels, tires, and color, it leaves one looking distinctly, if not remarkably, better than the other. Who'd have thought? The pan was completely refurbished, thereby eliminating all extra old build mounting holes and imperfections. The center spine was skinned for strength and the pans were replaced. The original molded in channel on the rockers was replaced with a rectangular tubing making it a much better fit to the body and also a rock solid platform as a base. The rear mounting area of the original pan was raised 5 8 inches to allow clearance for the dual IDF carburetors. Bodies are often cut for this reason. The added rake on the body also adds a slightly more aggressive stance without changing ride height. Both front and rear suspensions are adjustable to allow for an individual preference and to keep the rear swing axle camber in check. Custom front disc and rear brakes eliminate the need for weak wheel adapters and also tuck the tires into the body for a more original look. Seat platforms were custom water jet cut. They are lowered two inches to utilize the original seat slides, locks, and floor rails. This adds to the car's sleek appearance. Finally, the pan was put on a frame machine to assure accuracy, then sandblasted, primed, and completely coated with bed liner. The body was completely and correctly gone over with a fine tooth comb. All mounting holes, cracks, and imperfections were repaired, both top and bottom. The bottom was finished as well as the top, and then gel coated black when done. This car would do well at a car show, even if it were displayed upside down. Careful attention to windshield angle has always been one of my pet peeves, as this is one of the first things that can look wrong on a Manx. 
The dark red metal flake finish is stunning and changes appearance according to lighting as the pictures show. Very few of these kits were ever ordered with a top. However, several options were available at the time. This top is made of sombrella canvas. Typically used on boats, it's very durable and long lasting. Styling for the top sticks to the original design, but the unsightly bows were eliminated, keeping it clean when going topless. The side curtains also afford a certain amount of weatherability. A rarely added option would be the tonneau cover. It makes a nice storage area when traveling. Logan Upholstery was Bruce Meyer's supplier of choice. They designed and made the interiors for these buggies. This interior copies the Logan design patterns right down to the correct number of pleats in the seats. Another feature not available back then would be the side interior panels. They're designed to complement the original upholstery and add much needed pockets to the car. Two under seat snap-in packs include roadside tools, a tire repair kit with inflator, also included in the packs are common replacement parts such as cables, points, and a tow strap. This Manx is ready for the long haul. Exterior lighting is traditional early Volkswagen with the rear being re-chromed originals. Gauges include the GPS speedometer, oil pressure, voltage, fuel, and tack, all working properly. It also has a low oil pressure and voltage light along with turn signal and bright indicators. The tech also includes a programmable shift light. It has not been programmed or needed, in my opinion. Original black old style paddle switches complement the polished aluminum and burl wood dash. While building the dash, I wanted a radio, but not like the idea of any modern looking parts on this car. The solution was to hide the speakers under the dash and make the radio fold up out of sight. A one inch conduit tube was installed through the center tunnel. This is where all wiring travels fore and aft. This both protects the wires and hides them, eliminating any unsightly bird's nests common on many builds. The suspension is all new, including the steering box, tie rods and ends, steering damper, bushings, seals, and zerts. Link pins were also replaced, rebuilt. All brake hardware is new, not rebuilt. And that includes the master cylinder and all of the lines. The 1776 engine is a complete rebuild utilizing new cylinders, pistons, rods, heads, etc. It's a dual relief block with added free flow, high capacity oil pump and filter. It's been balanced and has a Crower Performance Cam. The dual IDF carburetors have been painstakingly tuned and jetted for this specific configuration. It's estimated 80 horsepower make for some spirited driving capabilities in a 1,350 pound car. The original Meyer Stinger exhaust is quite throaty but not overbearing. The dual IDF carbs add a very dramatic addition to the sound. They create a unique howl on acceleration and a turbo-like whistle between shifts. You can hear this in the driving videos of the car. It's very distinctive and in my opinion eliminates the need for a radio. The transmission is a Volkswagen 4-speed swing axle. It was professionally rebuilt and updated with new first and second gears allowing the new style synchros to be installed. Anything that may have been out of order was repaired or replaced, including the nose cone and bushings. It shifts like it should. It has a new, not rebuilt pedals, along with a shifter, shift rod, bushings, and coupler. One should note, however, when I installed the original shifter, it was for appearance. The newer short shift models are far superior, but not period correct. Axle bearings, bushings were also replaced, along with a clutch arm, bushings, and spring. Flywheel was turned and balanced and new throwout bearing and clutch were installed. This is not your typical runs good, new brake pads, oil change and tune-up car. It's new. If it moves, and in many cases does not move, it's new. With very few exceptions. 
Extreme attention to detail was carried out throughout the entire assembly process and no expense was spared. It currently has 265 miles on it and has been dialed in. As an artist and builder, I realize everyone has different tastes. I also admire the endless interpretations that have been done on the Myers Manx buggy. None are really wrong. I set out from the start to build this Manx in a period correct fashion with few mild twists. Much time was spent referencing old build photos along with original catalog and magazine photos. Again, the ultimate goal was to produce an accurate buggy that did not stray away from the original concept be completely rebuilt but still appear as a survivor. I wanted it to be capable of happily sitting among some of the best Myers Manx buggies ever built. I built this car to impress myself, not anyone else. I hope it shows.